Yeah, we're good. Mics are open. OK. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming on a not very busy day. We have not much thing to talk about today. Just the fun stuff in the usual Middle East. So um, today we have, um, you know, I, I think a timely topic of what's happening uh, with the Turkish incursion in Syria, uh, the military operation that started last week, uh, the implication on that on a uh, few regional powers actually, on, on Turkey, on the United States, on the Russians, and also uh, on the Iranians and uh, on the Syrian regime itself. We also want to talk about Iraq uh, in the aftermath of the demonstrations that we have seen, where that went, uh, where the demands have been met, uh, maybe Patricia wants to talk about the soft power of uh, maybe what Iran is doing in Iraq. That would be interesting. Um, and in general, we're going to talk about um, really maybe redrawing the maps of the Middle East. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this is the case or not, but we can ask Mike to tell us with this what's happening um, currently in, in, on the border between Turkey and Syria. So. Um, Allow me, I'm sure most of these, I mean, you know them very well, but allow me to uh, introduce him again. So start with Michael Duran, who's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. You are familiar with him and his writing. And then we have uh, Patricia Karam, uh, who uh, a regional di director for the Middle East and North Africa in the Washington, uh, Washington in the Republican Institute. Um, and we have, well, International Republican Institute. And we have, uh, of course, uh, Michael Prigent, who's also a senior fellow here at Hudson. And he's been um, writing about the region, particularly about the influence of Iran in uh, Iraq and Syria. So let's start just to make it kind of a more lively co conversation. Maybe we can start with what, what's happening in the region. Um, I mean, I can start with. Uh, a question, I don't know if it's provocative or, or just benign, no, but just now as I walk in on the breaking news, it says that Russia and Iran are willing and to mediate between the Syrian regime, the Kurds, and Turkey to end what's happening now. So this is a, a good start, right? Yeah, good start okay. for, for Mike Duran. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Mike, so what's happening in the region? <laughs> uh, so uh, um, with, the, with the U.S., Pull out um, the the YPG, which is the Syrian extension of the PKK, has now moved up uh, with, with no longer have, enjoying the support of the Americans. It's moved up um, under the Assad regime and the and and the Russians. Um, and so I, I was not aware of that statement, but it doesn't surprise me at all that they what what the Russians want to do. Um, is they want to establish themselves as the primary power in in the area, and they want to push the Americans out. I mean, the American the Americans have lost their foothold militarily, so they'd like to situate themselves as the as the arbiters of the line between the um, uh, between the, 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 the Turks and 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 the, and the, and the Syrians and uh, the arbiters in the relationship between the YPG. And the uh, and and the Turks. So the Russians are going to negotiate between the uh, between the regime and the YPG and between the Turks and the and, uh, and, and the YPG uh, to find an uh, to find a settlement that is that is comfortable to both, in which they'll be the guarantor and with the in, with the goal from the Russian point of view of of moving the Ameri of moving the Americans out. This was kind of um, baked into the. Uh, this is the dir dirty little secret of the American intervention in Syria, is that this was always baked into the into the cake, um, because the, the the reason the Americans aligned with the PKK, which is what the the YPG is, is because it has good relations with the Russians and the um, and, and the Iranians. President Obama gave orders to his uh, to his aides when when uh, when the ISIS threat rose up that he wanted to uh, fight ISIS but he wanted to fight it with uh, local actors uh, with the absolute smallest military footprint possible just special special forces um, so what happened is that the uh, the um, 
the Taliban faction in, in, in Iraq said, hey, we've got some partners uh, in, uh, in Syria that can help you out. That is the, 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 y, the YPG. And their good relations, and there's the YPG's good relations with the Russians and the, and the Iranians, was attractive to the Americans because Obama was at the time negotiating the JCPOA and um, uh, trying to come to an agreement with the Iranians and the Russians on the nuclear deal and also aligning the United States uh, regionally with the, um, uh, with, the, with, with the Iranians or coming to an agreement with the Iranians in, in the region. It's the same policy in Syria that we followed in Iraq where the United States basically um, unofficially partnered with the, uh, with the popular mobilization units on the ground to, to defeat ISIS, the popular mobilization units being those parts of the Iraqi security apparatus that are armed, trained, and equipped, and pretty much directed by the, um, uh, by the, by the Iranians. Um, so if you look at it uh, from an American point of view now, the question is, um, the question is, are, are relations between Ankara and the United States so bad that the only option Erdogan will have to solve his border security question is to do it within the Russian, the Russian framework? Or will the, the Trump administration, which is under a lot of pressure we see you know, from Congress and public opinion and else to, to put sanctions on Turkey and to press Turkey, will, will the president be able to find some kind of an accommodation with, with, uh, with, with, with President Erdogan that will keep, um, that will, that will um, pull Turkey back in the direction of, of the United States? I think it could go either way. It depends on how, how, um, how, uh, how Trump and Erdogan play their hands. Um, the, uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s, there was, it, it, it's nice to think of in terms of comparison. In the 80s and 90s, the Soviet Union supported the PKK, um, supported the Syrian government against Turkey, and the United States supported Turkey against the Soviets and the, and, 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 and the PKK. You could see this current situation reverting to that, where the, the Syrians and the PKK and the Russians are on one side, the American Turks are on the other side. Um, things that are moving in that direction are the tensions now uh, in, uh, in Idlib. Uh, uh, the, 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 Turks and the, the Turks and the Assad government, there's still an enormous amount of friction between them. Erdogan's no friend of Assad. Um, uh, and that, 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 that uh, ongoing tension would lead Turkey to want the support of the United States. Against the uh, against the Russians, but against that you have, as I say, all this um, outrage in the United States about Erdogan's intervention and pressure on on Trump to sanction Turkey, and that that will have the tendency to push Turkey um, in the direction of the Russians. So many to unpack here, but let me start with you, Michael, by an obvious question, which is um, the president says that we have defeated ISIS 100 percent, and we have destroyed the caliphate. Um, do you believe? that the president can make this statement with such confidence if it wasn't for the forces on the ground and mainly the YPG or the Kurds who were instrumental in uh, defeating ISIS and as a result they lost 11,000 fighters? Could, could that be done without them? Uh, no, but what I'd, like to, what I'd like to talk about are the conditions before the president's decision. Even before the president decided to remove US troops from northern Syria, we were already facing threats in the region, and we we're still searching for a foreign policy to address those threats. One is what you said, the threat, the indicators of an ISIS resurgence. Uh, we've, we've said to the president in different forums, through different proxies or different channels, that the caliphate is not defeated. You simply knock down a bunch of buildings and ISIS moved to the al-Qaeda model. You simply have taken territory temporarily away from ISIS. Uh, by destroying cities in Iraq uh, and by using the wrong clear and hold force. Like, my, like Mike said, uh, we couldn't build up a Sunni force like we did during the surge, the awakening. We basically built 90,000 static Sunni eyes and ears that could tell us when al-Qaeda was moving into a neighborhood and they could make a phone call and U.S. firepower would be on site within 5 to 15 minutes. In the least, we'd have Apaches in the air. Uh, that was crucial in decimating al-Qaeda. Uh, this also ties to the first abandonment 
uh, since the Iraq War of an ally, when we abandoned the Sunnis in Iraq uh, and left them to reprisal attacks from Shia militias, from Maliki, from Al Qaeda, and then this whole security force that secured northern Iraq left a void that something was going to fill, and ISIS ended up filling that. So. Going back to what Mike said about proxies in the JCPOA, at no time was the Obama administration going to build a Sunni force. General Nagata tried to do it. His hands were tied. Uh, anybody that we were trying to train had to sign something saying that they would go into Syria, but they wouldn't fight Assad. They wouldn't fight Lebanese Hezbollah. They wouldn't fight the militias. They would only fight ISIS. How do you go into a, to a boxing ring with four opponents with one hand tied behind your back, and all of them get to hit you, but you can't hit back? Um, so he was never able to build that force. And that's where you get language such as, you know, we literally trained, what, five to 100 uh, vetted uh, Syrian fighters. And as soon as they entered the Syrian uh, theater of operation, they were detained, arrested, threatened, killed, and their equipment was taken away. Uh, in Iraq, it was the Hashid al-Shabi, the Shia militias. And the arguments, you know, when we talk about the SDF, you know, there are non-YPG-affiliated Sunni Arabs in it. There are Kurds that are in it. There are a small percentage of, of Christians in it. But the c command and control was YPG. Just like the arguments made with the Hashid al-Shabi, 80% of the force is Sistani volunteers. They're not IRGC militias, but the command and control are. The command and control are Badr Corps with Hadi al-Amri and uh, Kitab Hezbollah with uh, Abu Mehdi al-Muhindis the deputy director of the Hashid al-Shabi. So at no time were we able to use a force unless Iran was willing to work with that force. And before the president's decision, we were already looking at increased tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and the UAE, Iran and Israel, and with, a, uh, with ISIS operating at the al-Qaeda model in Iraq, in Syria, and moving to the Sahel region of Africa, to set up a new caliphate absent, uh, absent uh, anyone trying to stop it. And where we find ourselves now, 12, 12 months ahead of a, an election, is <clears throat> we have a situation that the president may find himself in, one where ISIS comes back in force. And the reason I, I say that is the areas that ISIS have been cleared from are not, were, were being held by SDF forces. That's not the case anymore. When you, when you put a threat on the SDF or the YPG, and you say you're going to move into areas that, that the Americans and the YPG or the SDF had patrolled, it, uh, Raqqa and Deir Zor become less and less of, of a place you need to stay. And, and you know the Turkish goal is to move Sunnis into Syria to resettle Raqqa and Deir Zor. It's hard to do that when Assad's forces are already there. It's hard to do that when Shia militias are already there. And it's also the, the Afghan, uh, Afghan uh, Shia that Iran has mobilized and the Fatimayun that are there. So where do, the, where do Sunnis resettle to? Well, they're resettling to Kurdish areas, Christian areas, to Yazidi areas. And Turkey's goal from what I'm looking at is to push Sunnis into Syria to get them, to get them out of Turkey, and they don't care where they go from there. <clears throat> and, and this is another battle with proxy forces. Uh, proxy forces have not been able to stabilize Iraq, and we'll get into the Iraqi protests, we'll get into the, the, the IRGC-backed militias actually using snipers to take out influencers and protesters in Iraq, but they have not been able to secure Iraq, despite the best narratives from others in D.C. that say that Iraq is okay. The situation in Syria, as we know, uh, we have two missions in Syria, one we don't really talk about a lot, the other one was the enduring defeat of ISIS. This literally stopped the enduring defeat of ISIS campaign. It doesn't exist anymore in Syria because we don't have a force that, can, that is willing to take it on. And it's really going to be hard for a US special operator or advisor to embed with a local security force and say, hey, you, you want to do very difficult things that might get you killed? And they have these recent examples of betrayal. You know, I understand, you know, at the tactical and operational level. But the U.S. force is still on the ground. I think the president said they would yeah. go to the TANF. That's the other mission. That's the mission we don't talk about. That's the stopping the Iranian land bridge. That's the, the keeping the Shia militias from moving in uh, sophisticated guided missiles and rockets into the Syrian theater of operation where the range will be more effective to destabilize the Levant and to, uh, to attack Israel. Yeah. 
So as we look at what allies were doing before this decision in Turkey, they were already hedging their bets against U.S. US steadfastness in the region, uh, hearing, or listening uh, intently to the discussions in the debates between the Democratic Phil that's running for office and, and what the president's saying. And they are hedging their bets. Uh, we visited uh, Saudi Arabia about four or five months ago, and they said, we have, our new friends don't ask us to change. Those new friends were Russia and China. They weren't, you know, it's not the United States. They're saying, we, our new friends don't ask us to change. They just ask us, how much? How much do you want to pay, or how much uh, do you want? And, you know, it's, it's these policies that make allies, competitors, enemies, and adversaries all believe that they are winning if you're an adversary, a competitor, or an enemy, and an ally searching for new fronts, searching for, for new partners, and Russia is willing to fill that gap. As we tilt out of Southeast Asia to address the Chinese and, and Russians in other areas and try to step up our military capabilities, they continue to step back into the Middle East. They continue to step back into Central and South America, the Caribbean. And they're able to do things we don't. They bribe, they pay people. We don't do that, and that's good that we don't do that. But we should have some steadfast foreign policy behind uh, what our allies are trying to do. If we have a stop Iran policy, we should have a stop Iran policy. Right. Um, before I come to Patricia, let me go back to Michael. So if the Russians now play in this role, as you just said, uh, and filling the gap. Is it because of the U.S. policy in, in Syria? Number one, under the Obama administration, when the Russians were invited by the uh, Syrian regime to intervene on their behalf, and the administration didn't want to do anything, didn't want to uh, be involved militarily or otherwise in Syria. Now the President, President Trump, is withdrawing whatever left from the U.S. troops, whether 1,000, 50, or 28, and now allowing Russia to take over officially. So, they're playing that role and they're as an enabler because the U.S. had withdrawn. So what message does this send to the rest of the Middle East that you cannot rely on us, but you can rely on the Russians because they're pretty solid in that? Well, it sends a bad message, uh, clearly. Um, uh, but I, I, um, I disagree with the, There are a lot of voices out there um, today who are saying, uh, that we have betrayed our Kurdish allies, and, and, and that's what we shouldn't do in order to show everyone that American support is, 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 uh, is enduring and you can really rely on, on us. Um, and I, I see it rather differently uh, because I, for a couple of reasons. One is I think the ally that was betrayed here was Turkey uh, because we aligned in northern Syria with the PKK. Uh, the YPG is the Syrian extension of the PKK. PKK wants to separate the Kurds from, uh, wants a separatist st a Kurdish state that would break apart the Turkish Republic. And we were building up the PKK on Turkey's border. That was not our, that was not our intention, but that's what our power was doing. So, uh, and as I mentioned, the, the PKK is the, historically and continues to have, historically, it is the ally of the, um, of the Russians and the Iranians. And it okay. continues to have good relations with them. And we never asked it while we, when we were using its power, borrowing its power or its position uh, to, take, to, to defeat ISIS, we never asked it to break its relations with the Russians and, and, and the Iranians. They, the, 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 the YPG maintained in commissionally in the east, um, the Assad regime uh, position. Uh, flights went from Damascus to commissionally, and then from commissionally to Deir ez where there's, an, uh, there's another island of Assad uh, government um, uh, uh, control. And so, and there are Hezbollah forces, Hezbollah elements in, in commissionally as, um, as well. We never said to our new friend, shut that down. Because that was never part of the that was never part of the conception, uh, because it, because this was originally in the in the Obama framework aligning with the with the uh, with the Russians and the Iranians or at least totally deconflicting with them was part of the conception. That to me was the erroneous conception. That was 
the, 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 uh, the, the, the moment when we started distancing ourselves from allies and putting ourselves in a position where our allies uh, didn't trust us and our enemies didn't fear us mm-hmm. was with the larger Obama conception of aligning with, 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 with Iran. Remarkably, elements in the military went along with it. They didn't go, I, I don't know that they went along with, I'm talking about the American military, I don't know that they went along with the conception of aligning with Iran. But what happened is there, there was elevated in our system the notion that counterterrorism is the, um, is the number one strategic priority of the United States in the Middle East. And we built, in, the, in Iraq, during the Iraq war, when Mike was there, we built this incredible counterterrorism machine, uh, which if you ever see it up close, it's really quite amazing. I and mean, this is something that we do very well, is we, find, we identify terrorists and we go after them in, in a, in, uh, all across the globe. That's, but that is not a strategic idea. And so we substituted this machine, this counterterrorism machine, for strategic thinking. The, the job of the United States in the region is to bring order, or at least to bring order among its, uh, uh, among its allies. It's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult region to order because there are so many different fractious elements. Mm. Uh, but our, we're, we, we should be thinking about states first and foremost. Who are the states that are comfortable being up under American power? Those are Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and so on, and pr- helping them defend themselves against the states that want to undo the order, mm. which are the Russians and the, and the Iranians. That's the job of the United States, and the United States lost a sense of that job and substituted counterterrorism for it. So we were there then on the border building up this PKK state and alienating, that is the most, um, the, you, you know, as a, as, a, as a friend of mine, a pro, uh, professor at Princeton, Mike Reynolds, just said this morning um, at another event, if you ask one thing, what's the one thing that we could do to alienate Turkey? The, the, the worst thing that we could do, other than actually sponsoring attacks against Turkey, what's the one thing we could do? And it would be to al- a- a- ally with the PKK. Right? So th- just to sum up what I'm saying, in order, to, in order to carry out the kind of policies that Mike is advocating, where we are consistent and trustworthy and so on, we have to get the fundamentals right. We have to have a clear concept of what we're trying to do in the region, and we have to have a clear concept of who the partners are that we can work with. And then w- if we get the fundamentals right, then all, all of our impulses, uh, our, our interests and our, and our allies' interests will work, will, will work together. We, one last thing, along with this counterterrorism thing, we got used in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on to doing everything unilaterally, and we forgot that we actually need allies. And if we're going to take a step back and we're going to work through others, we have to take into account their understanding of their security. You can't go to a guy like Erdogan and say, you know what, that concept you have of the PKK being your enemy uh, or us being a threat because we're building up the PKK, that's really silly. You shouldn't have that idea. That's not going to work. Okay, I think Michael will come to this, but before that, <clears throat> so I think the situation in Iraq is different than in Syria. For example, when you just mentioned that you have a counter-terrorism operation, the U.S. forces there were invited. There was an agreement. There is a government that is allied with the United States in Baghdad. In Syria, is not the case. So the Assad regime obviously did not want the U.S. forces to be there. And you have hostile forces like the Iranians and the Russians. And also, it's always we come to the basic, which is my enemy's enemy is my friend. So uh, the YPG was willing to go along to fight ISIS because, and they allied themselves with the Americans. So I don't think the choices were not, or the situation was not analogous there. But I think, Patricia, you have a few things you wanted to, to yeah. pick up before we come pull, to across this way. And I can pull some strings together in some ways based on what both Michael and um, Mike. Mike said. Uh, this is the second time today you're on a Mike and Michael. Yeah, it's a very popular name. Um, so I think like just to, to, to kind of touch upon some of the things that uh, the other uh, panelists have, se- have said, we, I think we are In my view, we are facing a perfect storm in the Middle East as a result of a convergence of interests in all our historical enmities towards undermining the image and position of the US. And that's whether it's the autocratic order or the Islamist jihadist nexus or Iran or Russia, China. 
And all these malign forces are capitalizing on the fact that there has been a historical tendency of withdrawal. Um, all are trying to make it more costly uh, for the US to stay, and they're also trying to destroy what we would have wanted to leave behind, which would have been reasons for friendship, cooperation, and trust. And they're doing it in a number of ways, through disinformation and by co-opting proto-democratic civic forces. In particular, that's the angle that I'd like to sort of focus on. Mm. And Iran has been at the forefront. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about looking, uh, to look at Iraq as the case study, and look in particular, as you mentioned, uh, at the violent and leaderless uh, anti-government protest which erupted uh, in Baghdad and also half a dozen capitals across the south. And though, uh, they, though one can argue that they were previously in the making and they escalated post-ISIS with the inability of the government to sort of uh, uh, respond and, and provide services and, and, under, uh, and promote economic development to a certain extent, as well as the perception of increased corruption. And many, many Iraqis, especially in the South, don't have electricity and water. Uh, and this is really the basic elements at the cause of the protest. However, there have been a number of multiple dynamics that had overlaid this process, including actors who are trying to take advantage of the situation, whether to subvert, openly sabotage, or ride those protests. And, and, and critical are the PMUs who have participated, as you mentioned, in violence against the protesters. Um, of significance in these protests in this regard was that there are a number of elements that preceded uh, and fueled the anger of the public, including the dismissal of uh, the deputy commander of the counterterrorism bureau, uh, Abdel Wahab Al Saadi, a local hero. Who, and this decision was viewed to be to have been made under Iranian pressure. Um, and again, I, I say this as an example of, or what I what I'd like to see as um, as this growing influence of Iran in Iraq as having nonetheless sort of caused a backlash and created fissures. You mentioned Abdel, uh, Abdel Mahdi al-Muhandisi, who's himself faced in fighting within the PMUs. And many citizens have also called for the disbanding of the PMUs. Uh, one example preceding these protests was in 20, 2018, you had residents of Basra from where a third, at least a third of the fighters are from, who demonstrated against the PMUs. Um, protesters this time have stopped, have asked that Iran stop interfering. Now, the PMU leadership used then, in 2018, as it did now, in the, and in the context of a blackout, US or regional antagonisms to construct an external threat and try to maintain their constituencies in Iraq. So similarly, they've been, again, attempts so to, to, to continue the argument, to, sub, to subvert or mis mischaracterize the nature of the protests and achieve the goal of targeting the US. And this is consistent with a modus operandi, which is to play up US statements about the withdrawal or the rise of ISIS activity. What these forces agree on is the need to get the US out of the region, but more importantly, to see the, to see the region through an anti-American sentiment. And again, so this is the point that I'd like to make, that Iran's hegemony in the region is, is based as much on ideological, cultural, and messaging power than on financial and military presence. And countering Iran's hegemony would require ad addressing the intangible components as much as the hard power wants. And ideological influences consist of a number of things. Affinity with the Shia community and inheritance of this anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist discourse. The economic warfare you mentioned um, the effect of the sanctions, the economic warfare that's launched by the administration against Iran addresses the main element of the tangible. But Iran's success in outsourcing its financial drain to maintain its hege hegemony requires a head-on assault on the intangible. And uh, um, so the US, in contrast, seems to rely on its role in helping defeat ISIS to win Iraq's support, which is frankly stale. Mm. Uh, and so, again, this is an impediment to effective public dip diplomacy and to US policy. So re remedial work is needed at this point. Uh, remedial work in the form of political outreach to deconstruct the malign effort, effort and that focuses on how it's created and cultivated. 
uh, the U.S. withdrawal from direct engagement need, need not exclude a defense and a preservation of the U.S. brand. Um, again, this is connected in some ways to the em emergence of sound national narratives within which the, the role of the U.S. as a partner and a supporter will be recognized. So then empowering and in incentivizing local pro-democracy, uh, uh, patriotic voices is the route forward with a strong and independent Iraq as a key to creating a stable balance of power. And I think that the U.S. needs to prioritize this. Come back to you if you want to answer. Oh, sure. Nice points. A, a, a couple of things. I, I think, I think what, what Pat said is very important because these, these uh, IRGC militias in Iraq are not localized. Uh, they're in Syria as well. They're starting to move into ter territory that the YPG is leaving. Uh, to secure Kurdish areas. They're always going to pick Kurdish areas ahead of Sunni areas, and that's just the way it works, unfortunately. Um, they are also were part of an attack on Saudi Arabia. They were, they've also stepped foot in Jordan. They've stepped foot in Lebanon. Uh, they have regional goals. So it, it's not localized. I wish it was, but American foreign policy continues to allow permissive environments for Iran, Russia, China, our enemies, uh, our adversaries and our competitors, and it's based on this. And when, when you mention all those those remedies or things we need to, to look at, I just wonder what the appetite is in the U.S. foreign policy arena to do any of those things, or what a future president would actually do when it comes to Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan, for that matter. Our, our adversaries and enemies and competitors are looking at favorable outcomes with American elections. I actually believe if one president from a party, uh, if one president from a party wins, it actually helps them. It, it shouldn't be that way. It should be U.S. foreign policy should be consistent. Unfortunately, we've tr we've politicized everything, and we've even further split our tribes with this recent decision by the president to go into or to leave northern Syria. Uh, people that were that were uh, like-minded in curbing Iranian influence in Syria now are talking about whether or not the U.S. should leave northern Syria because of a betrayal of an ally or an insult to a NATO ally. Uh, all of these things are, are destabilizing, and everybody's seeking to take advantage of it. And to Mike's point about the U.S. strategy in building this ally, we have to remember Kobani. Uh, remember in broad daylight where ISIS was moving tanks and artillery in front of cameras? To, to start targeting this city. And uh, uh, Secretary Kerry said it's not strategic. General Dempsey said it's not strategic. Yet it was a recruiting tool for ISIS. Foreign fighters were flowing into Syria because of this victory in broad daylight that was covered by the international press with what? With Turkish armor overwatching Kobani and not doing a thing about it. And that goes back to what we heard the president say yesterday. President's position has, has changed in the last 10 days from don't touch our allies in northern Syria to, well, maybe the PKK is as bad as ISIS or, or maybe even worse than ISIS. Uh, remember, ISIS was the reason for this coalition. ISIS was the reason that US special operators on the ground met with their local SDF commander who happened to be YPG. You have a, you have a military captain an army captain at 35 or 34, and you have a sergeant at 27 meeting with an ally on the ground to go after the scourge of the earth, ISIS, and you forge relationships. And there is no grand strategy. I mean, the grand strategy was don't build a force that would alienate Iran as we're dealing with the JCPOA, and this happened to be the force. To that American soldier on the ground, this is the betrayal. Mm -hmm. To that American soldier on the ground, that CIA case officer, that diplomat that was engaging with a force that lost 11,000 in, in, uh, in the ISIS campaign, it, it, is, it is a betrayal. Because if you're a Kurdish commander, and I'm the first American you see, and I introduce you to five more Americans, and you've helped us defeat ISIS, take territory away, and you're the only key in ensuring the enduring defeat of ISIS, what happens when I'm the last American and I say, hey, help me tear down these defensive positions. We're going to do joint patrols with the Turks. Don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you guys. We're not going anywhere, but let's tear down these defensive positions. Let's tear down this base. Let's do that. And then 72 hours later, that American
captain on the ground or that, or that unit on the ground is told, you guys are exiting, you guys are leaving. And you have to go to that Kurdish fighter or that, that member of the SDF and say, I'm taking off. And as you drive away, Turkish artillery and airstrikes start happening. And that, that's literally what happened um, Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And that is the, the tactical and operational betrayal uh, for any future engagement. And, and I don't think anybody here doesn't think there's going to be uh, an American in Syria in the next 10 years fighting the next iteration of ISIS, al-Qaeda, or the, the new Shia militia threat, or in Iraq. And we're going to have to continue to fall in on, a, on, a, on a, an indigenous force, because this is war by proxy now. We're not going to use American forces anymore. We're going to embed, bring a proxy force, U.S. Uh, military capabilities. But we're going to have to forge relationships. How hard is it going to be for, for a 20-year-old 10 years from now to go back into northern Syria and Iraq and ask, ask their Kurds, hey, you guys want to help me with this Sunni threat? You guys want to help me with this Iran threat? And that's, those are the ramifications of these decisions. And the good thing is we have, we, we've been consistent at betraying allies since we started this whole thing, <laughs> meaning since we started this experiment that is the U.S., the United States. Um, just one last thing. The, the Russian force in northern Syria, they're military policemen. Uh, they're, it's aircraft. They're using proxy forces also. And they're relying on the Shia militias, the, the, the Afghan militias, the Lebanese Hezbollah. And the Syrian army is hollow. They have a couple of brigades that are combat effective, and everybody else is, has gone to ground. So they're using proxies also, the same militias. The Turks are using the same thing. It's, it's under the Syrian National Army. It is the opposite of this command and control dynamic that we talk about, where if the command and control decides what the force does. In this case, you, you have a good command and control in the former Syrian military. The problem is they have 30 to 40 different groups that aren't necessarily going to answer to them. So once Turkey clears away with artillery and airstrikes, what do these groups do when they've already vowed to say, we're going to fight Assad, we're going to fight the Russians, we want revenge, we're going to go against the SDF, we're going to go against the YPG. And, and you, this is a opportunistic environment for ISIS, for Jabhat al-Nusra or Hayat Tariq al-Sham. Um, th this is security degradation ahead of an election. And you know, it's to, to a so service member who served in Iraq and Syria who worked with indigenous forces, it looks like a commander in chief has betrayed them to run for election in 2020. And that's when you hear when you hear that from active duty members of the special operate uh, special forces community that this is the first time they've ever felt embarrassed. I get it. I get the strategic relationship with Turkey, but at the same time. There could have been a way to at least delay it for 30 to 60 days to allow an ally to hedge bets and leverage no, positions. I mean, that's exactly my question. So while many believe that Turkey has a legitimate security mm. concern of having, whether it's the PKK or the YPG at its southern border, um, including the most urgent critics, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who just now, as we speak, introduced a bill to introduce sanctions bipartisan sanctions on Turkey. Why Turkey has to take this unilateral decision? They've been talking with the Pentagon officials for over a year now to set up what they call the security zone. Um, why they, what's the urgency? What was the, the imminent threat that Turkey felt that they have to move now to do it? And don't you agree, too, that Turkey is using militias on the ground that similar to al-Qaeda in terms of their thinking, Jish al-Muhammadin and the rest, who being now, Turkey is facing now accusation of war crimes after the execution of 10 civilians, I believe. Um, and this is a report by a human rights organization inside Syria. Mm. So um, I, I, don't think, um, I don't think that the, we've been adequately um, apprised of what the actual situation was on the ground for, for the Americans there. Because we had about a thousand soldiers. The security for those soldiers was provided by the PKK. So you have, these, you have little small special operations bases and the perimeter is secured by the, by the, by the PKK. We knew when I say we, I'm not talking, it, 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 the, uh, Washington seems to be shocked 
by all of this, but the American operators on the ground who, and the architects of this policy, they knew um, that the PKK, the YPG is the PKK, and that they are aligning with us, not simply to kill ISIS, but to build their Rojava program. Mm -hmm. So for example, when, they, when we used them to go to Manbij, which was west of the Euphrates, we, we promised the Turks, first of all, that, that when we started the alliance with them, that they would never go west of the Euphrates. Correct. When we, then when they went west of the Euphrates, we told the Turks, we're going to take them back. They have the, the the reason that Erdogan is going into Manbij now. It's very symbolic because this is an this is an area uh, where a betrayal by uh, by his ally because he was promised explicitly that this would never happen. He was promised by Biden. twice. He was promised they wouldn't go there, and then when they went there, he was promised they would go back. He was promised that uh, um, uh, that when we when we armed it, when we armed them, we'd take the arms back, right? Now we're saying to them, well, did, you didn't really believe those things when we said them, did you? So we knew, we knew that they have a political agenda. Now, if you're, the, if you're Mike's special operator and you're on the ground and you're working with a guy to go fight ISIS and that's how you know him, then yeah, of course you feel betrayed. I, and I, 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 I am, uh, uh, completely understand that. But what's going on? You're working with that guy you're working with that guy on Tuesday to go to go whack ISIS. On Wednesday, he's clearing the Kurdish areas of anti-PKK forces and driving them to and driving them to um, and driving them to Turkey. Right? He has a political agenda that he's that he is carrying out, and you're going like this and saying, "Oh, I don't I don't see that. I don't see." I don't see that they have the Assad regime in Kamishli and they're working with the Assad regime. I'll just pretend that's not happening. Well, maybe they do and they don't have an alternative. Well, that's it. They don't have an alternative. Beca and, and, and so here's what happens. Here, 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 here's what happens is that when, 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 we have, when, we, when one of our criteria is we're going to have an ultra-light footprint, it means that our only enemy can be ISIS. Because that we can handle with our ultra-light footprint. We can't have an enmity with we can't have an enmity with the Assad regime, the Russians, and the Iranians. We have to we have to align our we have to align our policies so that they're okay with it. Because if they're actually working against us, then then our, our situation becomes untenable. So the minute when, when Erdogan comes and says to the United States, "You're building you're building Rojava. I want you to stop building Rojava, and I want you to guarantee me that you will never build Rojava." If we did that, if we said, yes, President Erdogan, we agree with you, we will not do that. And in fact, we will carry out the following steps to make sure that there will be no total political hegemony by the PKK over these areas. One interjection. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. wait we, the minute we say that, the minute we say that and we begin to work against building Rojava, then our PKK perimeter, the people who are defending us, melt away. And then we are, then, then we are suddenly vulnerable. And the only way to the only way to protect ourselves from that vulnerability is to is to is is to uh, introduce many more American troops, mm. many more American troops to for force protection, which is a which is a red line for Donald Trump because he said I'm not going to put more troops in. So wh what 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 the people who are saying, what the people who are saying, um, we should stay there. They're either saying we should fight Turkey. Or, or, or they're saying we should carry out a massive, um, a, 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 a massive political um, uh, um, nation-building exercise in northeastern Syria that is going to put us at odds with the Iranians, the Russians, and the Assad regime, and the PKK. Now, I personally would be happy. I, I personally would support such a project. But I, but I you know I've been watching American politics for eight years. It's not going to happen. No. It's not going to happen. So you've got to get realistic about it. Okay. Just to, to, real quick, just to be realistic about it, I, I don't think there's any Kurd in northern Syria that thought the U.S. was going to help build Rojava. The Iraqi Kurds, did you think we're going to help you build an independent Kurdistan after the 2017 uh, betrayal? Let's call it that. I don't think there's anybody in northern Syria that thought we were going to build 
Kurdistan there. And we were communicating that to Erdogan this whole time. He saw ex an example of the U.S. not willing to build something in Iraq with the 2017 Kurdish referendum. We were only there to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS and to stop That's the corridor. That's what we said to ourselves. But don't our you, power, but Erdogan, our power Erdogan was, believed our that. Our power was empowering the PKK. By our mere presence there, we were empowering well, But you, just, you always just say PKK. You don't say SDF. You don't say YPG. You don't talk about the Sunni Arabs that are, that are part of it. You YPG say PKK the, because YPG that's, is the PKK. That's, that's the scourge. YPG I, I, is the PKK. The, we, we propagandized ourselves. PKK and you, is operating we, inside Turkey. They're, we, here's the deal. We propagandized but here's the deal. ourselves when Kurds, we started saying this is not the PKK. Kurds, that, convinced, that convinced America it didn't convince the Turks. Kurds were, were fighting the PKK. The, 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 uh, the KRG were fighting the PKK. The Iraqis don't have a problem with Turkey targeting the PKK in Iraq and Sinjar and these other places. But I don't think Erdogan was worried about us building Kurdistan in northern Syria because the Kurds always knew that how do you build capital with, with Americans? You help them kill something, and then you try to get something for it. So they were always leveraging their best let's, with let's use, Assad, let's use the, let's Russia. Let's use the right terminology. Use the right terminology. It's not the Kurds. It's the, it's the PKK. No, it's the Kurds because the Kurds in... No, no, Mike, Mike. The, the Kurds in Iraq are not PKK. We're not, exactly. But, but and that's the Iraqi why, Kurds that's why went we to could broker, Syria. We, because they're not PKK, that is, why, that is why we could broker a relationship... Different we could broker is, is, groupings is, is, is of Kurds. There are seven different could, groupings of Kurds. We could broker a, one thing here. We could broker a relationship <laughs> between between Ankara and Barzani there, because Barzani is not PK. I know, but let me just let me just get one 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 sentence in here. All right. Erdogan Ankara, was never sorry. worried about us building Kurdistan in northern Syria. He used it as an excuse to roll in. Untrue. It's it's not it's totally just false. the case. No, and, it's not, and the Iraqi it's Kurds not, the Iraqi it's Kurds complete, it's a complete falsehood. It's, it's a total falsehood. It's every. Excuse. You agree to, to disagree. That's I don't right. even agree with that. <laughs> no, no. no. It's just a fact. Okay, Nobody was worried about let's that. Let's just, just clear one thing. The PKK, they operate inside Iraq. The YPG operates inside Syria. And therefore, you can call them the same, but they have two different names. Otherwise, they'll be, be called the PKK Iraqi branch and the PKK Syria branch. No, they yeah. They call, the, they, call, they call themselves different names right. to fool gullible Westerners. But it's the same organization. Are you fooled it's by like, the names? It's like, you know, it's... <laughs> but is there a distinction right, between the KDP and the PUK? Yeah, please. I have a yes. question that may help resolve yes, sure, this. Sure. And, okay, and please, turn go it ahead. And make it a little bit more, go. more constructive, which okay. is, we agree that, like, in some sense, uh, losing Syria is to a certain extent... Um, we agree that our interests lie in the fact that when, if we lose to Syria, we also lose it to Russia and Iran, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is... If we are to proceed strategically, uh, and knowing that you know, Syria is a battleground with Russia and Iran to a certain extent, and knowing that these developments enable Russia in particular to es escalate its importance, but also provide Iran with a mini empire that it can leverage, mm -hmm. how is it that we can win the battle or at least contain the danger of these strate strategic, what did you call them, enemies and adversaries in, in your title, I can't remember. You. So what do we do? The, the operation to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS in Syria has ended. Uh, it's, it's likely to end in Iraq as well. But militarily, it doesn't mean that ISIS as an idea. No, 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 no. Militarily, our, our ability yeah. to counter or the resurgence ISIS resurgence them. has ended in Syria. Right. Uh, in Iraq, I mean, this is, remember, ISIS has always seen Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. So has Iran. Uh, our exit from Syria helps everything that's going bad in Iraq uh, continue and accelerate. It allows everything that was going bad in Syria to continue and accelerate mm -hmm. to, to, our, to our detriment, to, to Israel's detriment, to those Iraqi partners that we're working with. And I think, I think this really isn't a win for Turkey to, to, to move in to a place uh, where you can't control your proxy force. And your proxy force is going to soon find out they can't return to Sunni areas. One of the key things about Iraq and Syria, and you, you told me this, is the Iraqi government and the Syrian government, meaning Damascus and Baghdad, have made it to where the, you can only vote in an election if you're actually voting in the place you're from. And there's a concerted effort to make sure you can't get back to where you're from. In Iraq, you, if you're Sunni, you can't get back to where you're from. 
Christians, it's an easy ask of the Iraqi government. Vice President Pence has even weighed in on this. How do we get the Christians to resettle Nineveh? Baghdad can't even do that, and that's an easy ask. It's because you cannot vote unless you get back to where you're from, and where you're from doesn't exist anymore if it's been destroyed. And a lot of the reconstruction has fallen in the hands of Shia militias. They live there now. So this whole thing, I don't, I don't see how this is a win for Turkey. This is punishing an enemy. And I, I, the biggest problem I had, I, I, the, the Kobani thing is, Turkey always saw the YPG, PKK, as more of a threat than ISIS. They were never really a partner in the ISIS campaign, and they won't be now. Even though, as they sell this to us, there is a YPG ISIS campaign. It's not an ISIS campaign. When we saw when they moved into Afrin, they bypassed ISIS positions. They used Jabhat al-Nusra people to show them how to get to Afrin. And uh, we communicated to them, and this is, this is, again, if you're west of the Euphrates, we had one policy. If you're east of the Euphrates, we had another. We communicated to Erdogan then, uh, try not to kill any civilians while you're targeting the YPG. And, and this was not, we didn't receive this outrage back then. I think a lot of this is political because Trump made the decision. That's why it's on the radar. If it was made by President Obama, I don't think we'd be talking about it as much as we are. We'd be trying to talk about it, but we wouldn't have this, this outrage. So I think it's great that we have bipartisan condemnation of bad policy, and bad policy not only from, from the US, but also from Ankara. And, uh, but what's gonna come of it? We've basically, we'll continue to destabilize uh, the northern I Middle think East. the question always is, it is about wars. There's no good wars. So while the operation is going on now, we don't know how long it's going to take um, and what the consequences on the ground because it shifts all the time and the dynamic is changes. So will it be a clear, op a clean operation as Turkey hopes? We have no idea. Now I think we're waiting for this meeting between the vice president and President Erdogan to see if they have managed to get a ceasefire some kind of cessation of hostility. We will see. But the bottom line is basically Turkey was not happy because they felt that the US has abandoned them because they did not fulfill their promise, as Michael said, of uh, clearing Minbij. And the Kurds, or the YPG in particular, feel betrayed because the American now abandoned them. So the US is basically damned both ways, right? We, we, we don't have the PKK or Turkey right now. so. And we, we, we're alienating a state. The, the, the strategic prize in this whole game is, this, is the international orientation of Turkey. That's the strategic prize. That is the prize that Vladimir Putin is playing for. Right. Let's, let's get in that game. <clears throat> just before I come to the audience, I just, uh, just one question came to mind, which is the reaction, not just from um, the Congress, both parties and both chambers, but also from uh, the Pentagon. If you listen to the statements that came out from Mark Esper, and he talks about he's going to Brussels, he's going to ask his allies, the US allies in NATO, to impose some kind of political and economic measures on Turkey. Um, he was saying that we, com we are adamantly never give the green light to Turkey to go ahead, and we, this is danger, dangerous operation, and it's going to uh, damage our relationship. Why do you think this? Uh, very strong reaction coming from the Pentagon. If you think this is legitimate, and Turkey has a legitimate needs, and we suppose we supposed to support an ally like Turkey. Because uh, I think it, it has a lot to do um, uh, with what Mike with what Mike said about the feeling of the of the of the uh, of the men in arms who are actually for the for the Americans on the ground in northern Syria. The Kurds that are fighting with them are their brothers in arms who defeated, who, who defeated ISIS. And I think that's a popular American understanding, including in the American government, that, that these guys are there defending their homes. We can all understand that. They are the people there in those cities, in, you know, in, 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 in Kobani and, um, and, and in Kamishli and, uh, and, and elsewhere, they are innocent victims of power politics. So we're sympathetic to them. There's loss of life. We see the Turks intervening with, uh, uh, with these, some of these undisciplined militias who are committing atrocities. And so the American narrative is our brothers in arms who saved us against ISIS are, are, are being destroyed by our erstwhile ally, Turkey, who's aligned with these, uh, with these horrible 
militias. When the Turks look at it, they see the, the United States supporting the, the, their enemy of, um, uh, of, uh, of three decades who's killed 40,000 people through terrorist, through terrorist acts. It's two totally, totally different pictures. Okay, Michael, you want to? Oh, no, Pat, Pat, Pat. I'm good, no. Oh, you don't want to follow up? Okay. Um, it's, it's, we ta I was talking to a couple of journalists the other day, and people that look at this problem said, and we all wake up in the morning, we look at our phones, and we always shake our heads and say, I wish I did something else. Um, I think a lot of us think that because who's listening to this? I mean, if you, if we talk about the Kurds and who we're alienating in, in Iraq and Syria, we, we've alienated Sunnis in Iraq, Sunnis in Syria. I mean, literally, we've, we've accepted the fact that f over 500,000 Syrians have died in this campaign. And in Iraq, you know, uh, a lot more have, have died. And this is just going to continue, but we have opportunities, and especially with Iraq, with the, the protesters that are it, they're leaderless, but they don't get the attention Hong Kong gets. In Iran, they're leaderless, but they don't get the attention Hong Kong gets. We don't get press into these places to use soft power, like you were talking about earlier. I don't think even Hong Kong get that attention. No, but it, but if but if they were but if they were killing a hundred people with snipers, they would. Yeah. yeah, there'd be media there. So I think we have an opportunity here to get this right, and it's by not supporting institutions in Iraq. Uh, it's supporting the people to save Iraq. We need to disfavor Baghdad and pay attention to the Iraqi people. This is the first time where Kurds and Sunnis can actually jump on a, on a train led by the Shia youth of Iraq that are, are religious, but they don't want to be led by religious parties that are more beholden to Tehran than their own citizens. And the calls of Iraq, Hura, Iran, Bara, you know, Iraq is free, Iran, get out. Those are loud cries, and everybody's waiting for the U.S. to just put a spotlight on this, to identify influencers. We have an, we have an election coming up in Iraq in 2020, and and I'll, I'll pass it off to you. No, no, no. No. Inspired no, but there's an election coming up in 2020, and again, this policy of saying you can't vote unless you're you're voting from where you live is a big, big deal. But if we can identify influencers and we can put a spotlight on them to run against these political parties, you can actually see in Iraq where the American they're seeing isn't in uniform, isn't a diplomat, isn't a journalist, but is an entrepreneur, is a professor, is a, a tech guy, is a tourist. We can actually get there, but the, the way Iraq is now, uh, this is by design. This is part of the Islamic Republic of Iran's strategy, is to have it weak and have it bend to Tehran. And we keep propping it back up so it can stand up a little bit every time it bends. And in that, we don't prop it up by saying push back. We prop it up by saying don't worry about it. We'll still be here. And, and I think that's a problem. The Iraqi people need to hear a loud message from the international community, not just the Americans, that these protests are real. It's like what you said. It's about water, electricity, internet. It's not about free college. It's not about you know, the things that we talk basic about here. It's talking about the basic needs in a country that puts out 3.6 million barrels of oil a day where an Iraqi under the age of 30 can't get on the internet, uh, can't have clean water, can't have electricity. Uh, and those are, those are issues, because what happens in Iraq affects Syria. What happens in Syria affects Iraq. And like our adversaries, they see Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. We need to look at it as one area of opportunity where we can actually go in and listen to the people and do something. I know that sounds optimistic and hopeful, uh, but idealistic, exactly. But I'm not making up this movement. This movement exists in Iraq. I'm not making up this movement in Iran. It exists. It doesn't have Western coverage, media coverage. It doesn't have a spotlight. We're not identifying the Guaidos. We need to identify the Guaidos in these areas, meaning people we can get behind and say, 56 nations recognize you as the leader of this government in exile. And our adversaries identify the Guaidos before we do, and then they put them in prison, or they just make them disappear. Uh, anyway, and this so adds one, one little thing which has to do with what you said. One of the uh, rallying cry of the protesters was, um, "We don't want parties; we want a place to live in." There was one nice quote, and it reminded me. I just came from uh, five days in Tunisia, 
where we observed elections there and you have uh, you know a new president that was elected the second president in the in the life of the this little young democracy and this president is you know a prof a constitutional law professor with absolutely no charisma who is not tied to any political party who campaigned door to door and did not does not have a social media presence and who as far as i can tell represent everything tunisians do not want uh, he, they don't want parties. They don't want the elite. They don't want the government. They want like an economy, uh, an economy that's booming. They want uh, services. <coughs> they want, uh, you know, they just want basic necessities. And it's somewhat, somewhat of a trend in the region. Like you look at Lebanon, what's happening now with the protests, also small scale protests against the elite, against the establishment, against for for things that aren't wor against what's working for an alternative. And in Iraq. It seems that we need to think about that, what that means in terms of helping provide an alternative for the, the, the system that exists, the political. And that's the flip side. This is the more constructive component of, uh, you know, if you are to look at the deconstructive aspect of countering malign influences, the constructive one is supporting this and trying to ensure that the alternative is something positive and is not just you know, someone who cannot deliver or yet another political, uh, political class that can't do anything about. Yeah. I think Tunisia is the brightest example of the Arab world from the Arab Spring till now. It defies everything that we know about politics, usual politics in the Middle East. Um, and uh, as you said, with this emergence of the new election and how they hand over power and the opposition concede that there is somebody else who is going to be the president, it's uh, an incredible example. And they live to what their name, which is the Jasmine Revolution, I think, when they started. OK, we open to uh, the floor to questions. So please identify yourself, ask a question, uh, not a statement. <laughs> this is just a question. Wait for the mic. Uh, thank you very much. This is Dr. Al Dimerdas. Um, one, one statement, PKK wanted to establish a state in Syria, which was going to be a Marxist state. Uh, Turkey's oh, operation yeah. basically cut it down. Um, so it is evident that the, uh, the current and the former administration have worked with the PKK, and the PKK is recognized as a terror organization. Is there any legal repercussions of this situation in, in Washington? The, the YPG is not. PKK is. That's the distinction. We carved it out. It is, the, it is it like never the, the right proxy between, force to use. Difference between Walmart and Sam's Club. You know, yeah, but they're, they're but, we, but we, carved, we carved it out. Oh. Just like yeah. we're not punishing Turkey for violating sanctions, oil sanctions on Iran, we carved it out. The YPG was never the right proxy to use. It was never the right clear and hold force. We should have always used Sunnis to go after a Sunni terrorist group. We weren't allowed to because it was political, because of the Iran deal. So yes, are there ramifications for working with the PKK directly? Yes. Are there, are there ramifications for working for something that's been carved out? No. I mean, uh, that's the reality of this city. We agree on that. We agree to agree. Uh -huh. <laughs> Finally, we got an agreement. Yes, please, wait for the mic. Good morning. Uh, my name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the American University here in Washington. Um, this letter uh, that Mr. Trump sent to Turkey is really something. You know, and uh, a few days ago, I was uh, across the street uh, at the Wilson Center in the Reagan building uh, talking to a former um, Russian foreign minister who's retired now, lives in Florida. And um, I was telling him the only time I spoke with uh, Vladimir Putin, we were talking about, well, you know, every military has people at the very top who do not like each other. And they just find a way to work together and push forward whatever, whatever initiatives they're working towards. And we came to the conclusion that if you don't, if, if you eliminate the folks that you don't like in every military around the world, there would be world peace. And everyone would be armed, but we would still have peace and it wouldn't be so uh, terrible now. So what I would like to ask is, um, what do you think the ramifications are of a letter that President Trump sent being so satirical, but the threats are very, very real, but it seems like you're joking. So if you're a, a soldier overseas seeing this from your leader, 
how are you reacting to it? How are you responding? Are you looking at each other like, yo, dude, this is crazy? Or like, what, what's the morale among, amongst the military? Thank you very much. Well, I don't think the letter had anything to do with the morale amongst the military, but I think the letter initially was, I mean, Nancy Pelosi just turned it over when she saw it. She didn't even look at it. Uh, but I think, I think um, the president, unfortunately, not only undermined Vice President Prent, uh, Pence and Pompeo be, before they landed in Ankara by saying, any decision to move into Syria is between Damascus and Ankara. He undermined his own letter by stating the same thing. Uh, how do you punish Turkey for doing something that the president now says is a decision between Ankara and Damascus? Uh, I, I, the letter, I mean, you know, don't be a tough guy, don't, don't be a fool, things like I think, I don't know, I think it's funny. Uh, I, I think it's funny. I think it's. In the military, I don't think you're taught to do correspondence that way. I don't think you'd say something like that. You may say airborne at the end of it or all the way, but you wouldn't necessarily say, don't be a tough guy, don't be a fool. My problem with the letter it goes back to what I said about the PKK, because the, the, for me, the worst part of the letter was that he said to him, um, uh, he said to uh, President Trump, said to President Erdogan, uh, that General Maslum is ready to make a deal. And uh, Maslum is PKK. Uh, he's the head of the YPG, but he, I mean, what I'm saying that it, it, it's not just that he's in the organization that is PKK. He has fought with the PKK as PKK, and now he's in Syria as YPG because he just crossed the border and changed his name, right? And the head of the, the, head of the PKK is Ojalan, who's in jail in Turkey. So Muslim's boss is Ojalan. And you're, you're, here's the president of the United States talking to a treaty ally, Turkey, President Erdogan, who represents Turkey, an ally <laughs> of the United States since 1953, where we have bases, where we have intelligence platforms, where we, who has fought with us in war after war after war. And you're saying, I want to mediate between you, President Erdogan, and this terrorist. Who's been, who's been fighting you. you. And you guys are basically on an equal level, and I'm going I'm to I'm mediate. If there's ever a statement that the president was going to make to Erdogan to make him go in <laughs> to, to, uh, um, to, to, to Syria, it was that. And it, but not, it's not the letter. That was the whole, this is, the, this is the, what, my whole point about how we were postured incorrectly in, in Syria. Because in in a, in a correct posturing, we have the ally Turkey and we have the proxy force, the PKK. We ought to be able to tell the proxy force what to do. Shut down the Assad, uh, uh, the Assad presence in Kamishli. Don't, don't, clear, don't clear Kurdish areas of non-PKK uh, 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 political leadership and so on. But we could never do that. Like I said, because we were so dependent on them. So we actually became the representative to our ally of the terrorist force. And that was, that was the disastrous mistake, and the letter just reinforced it. So, Michael, how is this different or similar to the president, for example, wanted to invite the Taliban, which is considered by many as a terrorist organization, to Camp David to have a deal with them and to negotiate on between them and the and the Afghan government. The 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 difference is that the the difference is that um, that Turkey, our presence in our presence in northern Syria, was dependent on the goodwill of Turkey, and we have totally alienated. And not we haven't alienated Erdogan. We have alienated all of Turkish opinion. Every patriotic Turk is supporting Erdogan, and Erdogan who has a, you know, a approval rating of 40, 50 percent, whatever you want to call it, 52 percent at most, however you want to, however you want to, whatever metric you want to use, has, a, has an approval rating with regard to this operation that, I, uh, that is, we're, I, I haven't seen the public 90%. opinion polls, but I'm sure it's at 80 or 90, or 90%. 80, 90, 90 percent. Yeah, when do you get that in politics? 90 percent. You get that when you, you get that when the United States when the United States backs the PKK against you. That's when you get it. When you decide to go when, to war. When you suppress the press for saying <laughs> otherwise. Hi, um, I'm Mehmet Kor from TRT World. I'm originally from Istanbul and have lived there all my life until about a year ago. So I'm much more perceptive to Turkish politics, uh, Turkish leaders, what they say, what they do. Um, 
So I can say in the last five, six years, whenever Erdogan speaks about foreign policy specifically in Syria, he always says that we're never going to let the YPG carve out a state from Syria or you know, uh, build a quasi-state, quasi-entity there, because um, that's a direct threat to Turkey. That's always what he pushes. And Mr. President, you earlier said you don't believe that Erdogan thinks that YPG is trying to... That the U.S. was going to help them do it. That's my point. The United States was never going to help them do it. And Erdogan knows that. Because you can see an example of not doing it in Iraq. Would you have but, I think they knew that because they were already hedging their bets and working with Damascus and working with Russia and working with Iran west of the Euphrates. They already knew that. There's no one surprised that the U.S. is leaving, and there's no one surprised that the U.S. was not going to help them build a Kurdish region in northern Syria. The but when the U.S. arms them, when the U.S. gives them, uh, allows them territorial control, it is helping them, isn't it? What's the difference? I, I couldn't understand what you mean. What's the difference in your mind? The, the difference is Erdogan never believed. I believed. I don't know Erdogan. You, you don't either. And if you would say anything no, bad think. against him, you'll probably be put in jail. But um, my thing is no, here. That's not, that, that's okay, no, but let me answer your question. I'll take back that. Sorry. You're not going to go to jail. It's not true. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have that's me on your interview and ask me what I actually journalist. think about this. Sorry. That's very offensive to any Turkish. Okay, I, I apologize. Let's go back to answering your question. Well, let me tell you something. Our, our reporter in Turkey has been kicked out for the coverage. Turkey has a pretty bad record when it comes to treatment of journalists. Uh, it's not, I'm sorry, it's, it's not the same thing. There are laws in Turkey that says you cannot belittle the government. It's not the same as satire in the United States. There are cultural connotations that are different. Uh, I can observe sure. this because I recently came here. And, and uh, no, if I'm able right. to go out and say something bad that you would consider a swear word to here, it would just cause an argument. If you say that in Turkey connotations are completely different, it would literally cause murder. And that kind of thing is not co tolerated, not only in the political sphere. Let me just answer your question. Let me answer the question. At no time has a U.S. president communicated to Erdogan that we are going to build a Kurdish state in Iraq or Syria. I don't think Erdogan was worried about this. I think this is an opportunity to do a grab, to do things, but it's not working. Everybody's using a proxy force. I don't expect the Russians to fight the Turks. I don't expect uh, the Syrian army to fight the Turks, but I expect their proxies to fight each other. So they're all going to fight each other, and all the great powers are going to kind of sit it out. And that's what's going to happen. It's going to destabilize. There's no danger of having a Kurdish region, an autonomous region in northern Syria. There never was with the U.S. there, and there certainly isn't a chance of it now. There's not a chance of it in Iraq because we aren't for it. Baghdad's not going to allow it. The security forces don't exist to allow it. The security forces exist to prevent it. Uh, I'm not worried about it. I don't think Turkey was worried about that. This is an opportunity to punish an enemy. How do you have ninety percent approval for this? If there you have ninety percent approval because it's it's a patriotic thing. Just like you said, you thought it, you said it was naive of Americans to feel this this tie to a Kurdish ally in Syria. This is the same the thing. Sir, this the, is a propaganda it, moment for, so, for both of our countries. What you're saying is so wrong that it's not wrong. You Syrian, just disagree with it. No, no, I disagree with it. You because just disagree I disagree with it. with it because it is wrong. The <laughs> the, the the, the Syrian, I love this guy, so I'll never say that about him. I just the, Sir, the, the, Sir, the Syrian Kurdish community is sociologically. Don't call him PKK. Don't call him Syrian Kurds. No, I'm community. talking about. I'm talking about. I'm They're talking PKK. about Kurds. No, there is I, no. I, there is no I, Kurds. It's only PKK, un, Mike. I unlike some. I choose my words. You're not going to like what I have to say, guys. I'm sorry. I, I, unlike, you're going to be okay I though. Choose my you guys words, are winning. I choose my words carefully. The Syrian Kurdish community is the sociological extension of the Turkish community. It's going to be 60 percent of so their workforce. If you, the build, if you build, if you build a, a PKK statelet on, on the border, then you are an was, objective threat. Was the U.S. going to do that? You are an objective. If, if one is built on the border, it is an objective threat to Turkey. So the, Ameri the, the, uh, the power umbrella that America, the, that America built there 
was allowing them to build the, to build the statelet, whether we, whether we told ourselves that's what we were doing or not. And as my, my point to this gentleman here, to make it worse, we gave it international legitimacy and our diplomatics and our and our diplomatic support. That's what that that's that's the that's the meaning of that of, that's the meaning of that letter, and that to, that to the Turks, as much as the as much as the as the Kurds being armed trained and equipped by us, the PKK being armed trained and equipped by us, and building Rojava, us giving them that diplomatic support is the is the is the uh, is the thing that is going to most make the uh, make Erdogan take action because that is a threat. It's, it's the capital, the political capital they earn by fighting ISIS. The international community is set to punish Turkey for this. Whether I'm wrong or you're wrong, Turkey's about to get punished for this. Uh, Turkey, but Turkey is going to take that punishment because this is a vital national interest for them. And it, it was agrees. an unnecessary rush into northern Syria. It wasn't, there wasn't a, a, an imminent threat of something. It's destabilizing. It's basically get all you can before a U.S. election. This is... Um, this is the most inevitable event I have witnessed in international politics since I've been watching international politics. We were always going and to And I know it, and I can prove it, because I predicted it 18 months ago, right, right. here on this stage. Yes. I'll re I, I retweeted that as well. Um, I, I don't know if you have time. Well, but we, with we, this we started late. We, we can do okay, another. I know you want to give it to the White House, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I have to go to. No, no, no. You already no asked a question, but you can ask another question. If nobody else is. There's a lady there. I'm there. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Nicole. I'm from the Heritage Foundation. I wanted to about, ask about something that hasn't been touched on, maybe ease some tension that's going on. Um, so do you guys have anything to add in terms of the um, dam that's being built in Turkey right now, Any how that will affect the conflict maybe in the next couple months? Um, I don't have any information on that. Mm -hmm. The dam the that's dam? being built? I have, you know, I, 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 I like you so much. Why do you ask questions I can't answer? <laughs> okay, there's a gentleman, I think, here. Yes, please. Great debate, thank you. Um, President Erdogan has made the case that he wants a section of northern uh, Syria cleared with, by a 20-kilometer uh, free zone because he wants a place, he says, to safely uh, allow the return of the million plus uh, refugees that have resulted from the, from the war. Yeah. Uh, can you address what your thoughts are on, uh, just say they, on that position? The people that he wants to resettle in that safe zone aren't from there. Uh, they want to go back to their homes. Their homes have already been demographically changed in order to secure a, a vote that's favorable to Damascus in any future election. It's a strategy to displace Sunnis, to, to bring in others that are pro-regime and settle in these areas. I don't, I know I have some very good friends in this audience that disagree with my positions. But do you really believe that Sunnis are going to be able to go back to their homes in Syria? Nobody talks about the three million uh, Syrians that are on a terrorist list that Assad has. Three million Sunnis. How many refugees went to Idlib because of all of these displacements? Three million. Idlib can't handle that. Where are they going to go? Idlib's the untold story here. No one's talking about Idlib because we're all focused on Iran in the Gulf. But Russia and Assad were conducting airstrikes in these areas. Uh, Turkey's supposed to defend these Sunnis in Idlib. Uh, the, the call is from, from Assad and Russia that you're harboring about 10,000 uh, jihadists, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra guys. Um, <clears throat> where are they going to go? Everybody wants revenge. There will be no, again, there will be no military fights, but there will be proxy fights. Everybody wants revenge, and to bring in, what, he said three million, three million refugees from, from Turkey into an area where another million are moving into Iraq because they're being squeezed out. They can't go to Raqqa and Deir ez-Zor. They can't go to Turkey, so they're going to Iraq, and you know, they're going to be absorbed by the KRG. Again, they're going to be absorbed by places that can't house them. And you're going to put in three million, and as soon as the international community threatens you, you're going to say, well, I can send them your way, Europe, if you don't support what we're doing. They're not going home. That's the issue. Iraqis aren't going home ahead of elections to vote, and Syrians aren't going to go home ahead of elections to vote. And the laws that you, everybody needs to look at are, are this. You cannot vote if you don't vote from where you're from. And where you're from doesn't exist anymore. Somebody else lives there. 
and they don't want you there. And that's the issue here. It's not simple. Uh, where's ISIS going to go? Are they getting squeezed out? Do they flood back into Iraq? What do they do? Uh, everybody wants to settle scores. And this is the prime environment to do that. Uh, and it's, it's destabilizing. Two minutes for the last question from the lady uh, from TRT. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give it to a fellow journalist. No. <laughs> yes, yes, OK. Hi, uh, Sarah Karacham. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I respect Kurdish people's right of self-governance and Israel's right to exist. But I would like to ask, today, Senator Graham just said, like a hour ago, that uh, it's about uh, Israel is at risk. This is about Israel, ISIS, and Iran. And at the beginning of the war, it was about Israel's security because of Syrian regime's close ties with Iran. That made all European countries send their all Sunni extremists there. They are allowed to go there. They, uh, and also intelligence sharing happened between Turkey to let them go there. And then now, uh, we are speaking about this is a threat of ISIS and Israel is at risk. How this is become turning, same thing rolling around. I mean, what is your take on this side? Well, somebody asked me, or somebody made, asked a question, why are you doing a panel on this? Don't you always do panels on these things? And I said, yeah, because the Middle East hasn't fixed itself yet. <laughs> I mean, of course we're going to talk about this. So it goes back to this full circle. It's, and it's, it's this recipe. Temporary alliances or temporary solutions that lead to the permanent cycle of violence. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, Lindsey Graham's comments, we don't have an ISIS campaign anymore in northern Syria. And the president's talking about removing all troops from Syria. Hopefully not. Hopefully they stay in the southern part. And that's the Israel threat, because that's the land bridge. That's where we've seen Kitab Hezbollah and other militias uh, launch precision guided rockets and missiles towards Israel, conduct drone attacks. So it is a, an Iran issue. Iran's always going to be an issue in the region. And they're, they're accelerating their activities in, in hopes that Europe caves. Uh, Israel is dealing with its own problems. Israel is, we, we know Israel is OK with Assad. I mean, they've communicated that we, this is the devil we know. They're not OK. And they're OK. And Putin's OK with Israel conducting airstrikes against Qasem Soleimani proxies in Syria. It's the wild, wild west. The problem is it just got less safe. Everybody was already carrying a weapon. Now everybody can actually shoot everybody they hate. Everybody's in close proximity. And that's, that's the difference. And that's why it's a concern. All right. So with this, I have two I mean, pieces. Anybody else? Do you want to add something? All right. So with this, I'll, I'll give you two pieces of news. Uh, number one was breaking that the White House will suspend the invitation to President Erdogan coming to Washington, depending on the talks with Vice President Pence. And a minute ago, the president tweeted, and he said, great news out of Turkey. A news conference shortly with the VP and Secretary Pompeo. Thank you to Rajab Tayyip Erdogan. Millions of lives will be saved. So here you are. This is from the president. And one last thing I think I will say, um, many, many people will believe that the Kurds uh, qualify to have a state of their own as a nation state. The problem and the tragedy of the Kurds as people, they are wedged between four powerful neighbors. They are scattered across Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. And these countries with the superpowers of the world will, not, will never allow them to have their own state regardless. So somehow they have to find a way to live within the countries they live in. Well, the British, uh, <laughs> let's not start, get us started on the British, where <laughs> all the policies of, of colonial Britain has led to the chaos we see in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Asia. And all bad so, news is always anyway. delivered better with a British well, accent. Well, anyway, hopefully lives will be saved. So this is how we're going to end this uh, panel. Thank you all for coming, and thank, thank you. you so much for our panel yeah. today. Did you like it? Yeah. It was fun, I'm sorry we talked soon. No. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. <laughs>